Hello, I'm Andrea Agathoclis of the Federal Trade Commission, and today I'm joined by Janet L. McDavid, a partner at Hogan & Hartson. Today, Ms. McDavid will be offering us her thoughts and memories of her diverse career in antitrust law. Thank you for joining us today, Jan. Could you tell us a little bit about your personal background? I'm originally from Minneapolis, Minnesota. I went to college at Northwestern University in Chicago and then Georgetown Law School. I decided I wanted to be a lawyer when I was in the ninth grade. There were no lawyers in my family, but we had some friends who were lawyers, and we did a mock jury trial in ninth grade. I loved it and decided I wanted to go to law school. Did you win? I did. It was a <laughs> slip and fall case involving a bus. Well, congratulations. <laughs> what specifically drew you to antitrust law out of all the options once you were at law school? I loved antitrust in law school, but I didn't want to do antitrust because it was the days of the IBM case that you were talking to Ed Zimmerman about when I arrived. And the reputation of antitrust was that there would be 50 lawyers working on it, and I didn't want to be the 50th lawyer on a project that involved nothing but reviewing documents. So I started actually doing securities litigation. In the course of doing securities litigation, I discovered that I really liked big, complicated cases. And so I went back to antitrust, which I had loved in law school. So you started out at a law firm, or where did you go after graduating? I went straight to Hogan & Hartson. I was a summer clerk at Hogan & Hartson during the summer of 1973 between my second and third year in law school. I spent my first year summer, actually, with a small Minneapolis law firm because that was the only place I could get a job, and they paid me $100 a week. It was the first time anyone had ever paid me to spend time in a library, so I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. <laughs> then I worked for Hogan & Hartson, and I went straight to Hogan & Hartson after law school, and I've been there since 1974. And you began in securities. It seems like you spent some time there. I actually accidentally began in the tax department, but that didn't last. <laughs> how, long did, how long did that last? We had a rotation program, and so it lasted exactly four months. Okay. <laughs> And so once you arrived in antitrust, do you remember the first types of cases you were working on, your first well, matters? Well, most antitrust in those days involved either counseling or litigation. The agency side of the practice was not nearly as well developed as it is today. And I remember working on a very large lawsuit in which our clients were actually the major oil and gas companies, and they were plaintiffs in a price-fixing case. My, how times have changed. It, they definitely have changed. And it was a little unfamiliar for them, even at the time. In joint meetings of all of the uh, oil and gas companies, they would invariably refer to themselves as defendants. <laughs> so when did you start to see, see a shift in the types of work that you were doing? I guess the emergence of the agency practice. I think probably in the mid-80s, I began to see more of the, of the agency practice develop, although that was also the Reagan administration when some of the agency stuff uh, became less significant. And today, what would you say your composite, the type of work you do is? I'd say the bulk of my work is agency work. Probably 60 plus, 60 to 70 percent. It obviously varies from year to year, but 60 to 70 percent of my work involves the agencies. And the rest is pretty evenly divided between litigation and counseling. Well, I want to talk about some of the mergers that you've worked on, um, and specifically kind of what some people refer to as the Big Bang of Second Request. That's the merger of ExxonMobil. Yeah. How did you approach that when the parties came to you and said, we want to do this? What did, you, what did you tell them? If you could just give us an overview of what that experience was like. Well, my firm had represented Mobile for many years on antitrust and litigation matters. And when I got the call from the general counsel, Sam Gillespie, he just asked me to come out and chat with him. We had talked, actually, previously about a couple of deals that didn't go. And so I didn't know exactly what he had in mind. But his first assignment was to determine whether a merger with Exxon was possible. And that was an undertaking that we did jointly with counsel for Exxon, Rick Rule and Deb Garza from Covington at the time. And it was a period in which there were only four or five executives in the company who were aware of the potential transaction, so there was no way of getting good, reliable access to any information from inside the company. So we largely had to operate on the basis of publicly available data. And the question was, could we advise the board that the deal could get done? And if the deal could get done, we, we knew remedies would be necessary. The question was, what were the remedies, and were they remedies that the parties were willing to accept so that they would bind themselves to committing to go forward with the transaction? 
So we worked cooperatively with Exxon's lawyers, and we also worked cooperatively with the Mobile and Exxon lawyers outside the United States and the European Commission because we needed the same advice there. We had roughly six weeks to get that work done, operating almost entirely on the basis of publicly available information. And inside my law firm, there were only five lawyers who were aware of the transaction. I worked with two other partners and an associate, and the managing partner was aware. We couldn't tell anyone else because it was so sensitive. Hmm. It was a Project Lion because we couldn't refer to the tiger. Everyone would have figured out <laughs> it be. who it was. And at the end of the six weeks, we briefed the board on a Sunday morning in New York, right about Thanksgiving time. I think it was just the weekend before Thanksgiving. We told them exactly what the issues were likely to be in the United States and in Europe, and we told them what remedies would be applied. And we got it all right. Wow. Uh, we underestimated the number of gas stations that would have to be divested because the Federal Trade Commission changed its policy in the middle of the deal in terms of how much it required. But we, had, we got everything else right. Wow. And I was pretty proud of that. So what was it like working on a merger of this scale in terms was, of the production? It was just, the whole thing was completely overwhelming. We started work on the project in mid-October of 1999 or 1998, and the deal closed December 1, 1999. The deal was actually announced, I think, on November 30th and closed 365 days later, exactly one year from the date of announcement. Uh, in order to get this project done, I had a team that at times consisted of 25 lawyers at Hogan and Hartson, and an enormous team of inside lawyers from Mobile. We actually took over an entire portion of one of the three buildings at Mobile's headquarters in Falls Church for the document production. And it was staffed by teams that worked 24 hours a day. We had three eight-hour shifts. Oh, my goodness. Now, the company supervised the document production. Because they'd done a lot of large case litigation, they had a very good handle on how to do document production. So we did not get involved in the hands-on searches for documents except with respect to senior executives. So we were able to focus on the merits. Some other matters you worked on. You represented American Express in the DOJ investigation of Visa and MasterCard. That's right. It's a, a pretty interesting case. It uh, was, and when the general counsel first called me to ask me to do it, she asked if there was any reason I couldn't devote whatever time was necessary for the next three to four months until it was over. And I think it was five years oh. <laughs> before the Justice Department actually filed the complaint and the matter was litigated. And so you were in the role of a, of a third party, I was a third party complainant, trying to encourage the antitrust division first to investigate Visa and MasterCard and ultimately to sue them. And what, uh, how was that different since you were used to being in the role of defendant? Well, one of the things that was most unusual about it is that eventually nearly everything we did was disclosed because of the lawsuit. So submissions that we made to the Justice Department all came out in the course of discovery with third parties, which isn't something you really think about. Mm in the course of being the complainant and something I've always kept in mind ever since. I can imagine. Um, more recently, you represented Carnival and its merger with P&O Cruise Lines. Did you get to do any cruising to uh, define the product I market yourself? I had only yourself? ever taken one cruise at the time, and, and Carnival didn't know it, but it hadn't been on one of their ships. <laughs> <laughs> um, Carnival at the time was already the largest cruise line in the world. It consisted an, of a number of brands in addition to Carnival Cruise Lines. There was Holland America, Seabourn, Cunard, and several European brands. They had always wanted to acquire Princess and had been wary of the antitrust risks. But Royal Caribbean and Princess announced a merger. And Carnival said, well, if we ever want to do it, now's the chance. Because they knew they certainly couldn't acquire a combined Royal Caribbean Princess. And so it was a hostile takeover in which we were unable to talk to Princess at any point in the process because they had a contract binding them to Royal Caribbean. Royal Caribbean tried to spin the story that risks of an antitrust 
problem for Carnival were much higher than the risks of a deal with Royal Caribbean and Princess. And part of our assignment was to disabuse the public and the Princess shareholders of that notion. I think the Royal Caribbean guys knew that if they lost that argument, they were going to lose the deal because the price Carnival was paying was significantly higher than the price the Royal Caribbean was, was paying. So we proceeded throughout the investigation, both in the United States and Europe, as a hostile tender offer with two competing deals on the table, both of them simultaneous, both of them going through the process at exactly the same time, and both of them raising exactly the same issues. It was my advice to the client from the very beginning that the risk posed by a Carnival Princess deal and the risk posed by a Royal Caribbean Princess deal were not differentiable. You simply couldn't measure the difference. And we convinced the princess shareholders not to proceed with the transaction to allow the investigations to take place. And in the end, the deals were cleared in every jurisdiction and Carnival won. Well, I want to come back to that in a little while to discuss the international component of that. But in the meantime, you also uh, are regular counsel to General Dynamics. Yes. Um, so you have appeared before the FTC and DOJ, and DOJ in multiple defense industry mergers. What's that like for you? Well, it all really began when the Federal Trade Commission enjoined a merger of two defense contractors in about 1990 or 1991, the Olin mm -hmm. Lyon transaction. Up to that point, I think most of the defense industry didn't think their transactions were likely to be subject to significant antitrust review. And the fact that that transaction was prohibited by a federal court sent shockwaves through the industry. When the Clinton administration first got into office, one of the first things they did was to form a task force at the Defense Department to study the application of the antitrust laws to the defense industry, and in particular to mergers and acquisitions. I was a member of the task force. It was chaired by Bob Potofsky. It included some folks from the Federal Trade Commission, included people from industry, and a handful of outside lawyers. And I think the expectation was that we would recommend an exemption for defense industry transactions. In the end, we wrote a report that concluded that the merger guidelines were sufficiently flexible to take into account the unique characteristics of the defense industry. We recommended closer coordination between the agencies and the Defense Department. Up to that point, the Defense Department had really been hands off. They didn't have access to the internal information that the agencies learned in the course of the investigation. So in the Oil Olin Alliant transaction, DOD did not know, for example, that there were internal documents on the Alliant side saying that if they could acquire Olin, they could raise prices 15%. Had they known that, the Defense mm -hmm. Department might have taken a different position on the transaction. So we, we p brought everyone into the same tent, allowed them to cooperate, and now the Justice Department and Federal Trade Commission effectively, I think, treat the Defense Department as their client for purposes of these transactions. Taking a step back from some of the specific <coughs> matters you've worked on, um, since you began in the early 70s um, versus what you see now before the agencies, how have things changed? Not just in terms of the second request components, but in terms of the material that you take from clients, the, the, the product you put together to try and convince the agencies. That hasn't changed dramatically during that period. What we've always done is to try to take an approach with the agencies of explaining to them why we've concluded whatever it is we're explaining does or does not pose antitrust problems. And to do that by marshalling facts and explaining those facts, putting the facts into a digestible format for the agency. I've, I call it spoon feeding, <laughs> but I don't mean that in, in a derogatory way. Just make it as easy as possible for them to understand how we got to the view we got to. And not to make it an adversarial process, but rather a collaborative process in, we, in which we explain the facts in our reasoning. Looking ahead, what kind of changes do you think would be useful uh, in terms of increasing the efficiency of reviewing transactions? Well, the biggest problem right now is simply the explosion of electronic documents. Uh, even a relatively small transaction ends up costing a dramatically large amount of money. I don't think people in the agency who have not been in the private sector have any appreciation of what's really involved. And it's, it's simply backbreaking in terms of the, the scale of the problem and the cost is staggering. 
the ExxonMobil transaction in which there was a fairly limited production of electronic documents involved the production of 20,000 boxes of documents. Mm -hmm. Mobile produced 12,000, Exxon, or, I'm sorry, Mobile produced 8,000, Exxon produced 12,000. We hired a warehouse for the Federal Trade Commission to store the data because there was nowhere else to put it. <laughs> I mean, where do you put 20,000 boxes of documents? Today, it could all be done electronically, but that doesn't mean that that makes sense. It's, we've got to find some way to reduce the burden on both the companies and, and the agency. Frankly, the agency can't cope with that level of data either. And there's no sensible way for anyone to review it and get to the bottom of it. Turning to you personally a little bit today, you are among the first women partners at your law firm. I think you said you were the fourth? I was the fourth. Could you just describe your experience coming out of law school as one of the few women into a very large, prominent DC firm and the challenges you've faced over the years? Well, my challenges actually went back a little further than that because my parents were absolutely convinced there was no future for women in law. <laughs> and they wanted me to be a teacher. Uh, it took quite a while to convince them that there was actually some reason to do this. And they didn't really buy into it until I made law review uh -huh. <laughs> after the end of my first year in law school. They kept thinking that I would come to my senses and realized that none of this was going to work. Uh, at the point in which I was in law school, 15% of my class was women, which was the largest number at Georgetown in history. You didn't have to go back very many years before there were single digits. Wow. So we, we thought we were pretty lucky. Law firms were actually interested in having women as opposed to asking them when they were going to have babies or if they were using birth control, which were the kinds of questions that people actually asked in the 1960s, stunning as that seems. So they were interested in having women. And so women who had done well in law school were hot commodities. And I really had my opportunity to work virtually anywhere I wanted. Why did you choose Hogan? The reputation in law school was that it was simply a nicer place to work than the other major Washington firms. I had a, a, an old family friend who always recommended that I should do what was ever advisable to maximize my flexibility in my professional career. So he said, make law review. That'll give you the widest array of choices of options when you, when you graduate. Go to a large law firm. You can always go anywhere else you want to after a large law firm. Uh, I stayed. So I, I decided to take a second year job at Hogan and Hartson to test out the story as to whether it was indeed a nicer place to work, and I never interviewed anywhere else again. Wow. I worked for a small Minneapolis law firm after my first year because Washington firms didn't hire first-year students. I was the first non-clerical woman who had ever worked there. So I got dress code memos, I got invited to the, to the lawyer luncheons, and I got invited to the baby showers for the secretaries. Wow. So when you joined Hogan, were there any women there already? What was kind of the role? There were three women lawyers in the firm when I joined, uh, one of whom, none of whom were partners, one of whom was leaving the week I came as a summer clerk to go back to Kansas to marry her high school boyfriend, who was a high school basketball coach. And some of the older male partners were saying, I told you that's what would happen <laughs> if we hired him. She's a judge on the Tenth Circuit today. In fact, she's the chief judge at the Tenth Circuit. So. I think that worked out <laughs> all right. Uh, the other two women who were there became mentors and very good friends. One of them made partner within a few years, and she had three children. She had children fairly shortly after she graduated from law school. And so the firm had coped with the issues of women and families very early in this process and made the policies for Sally Detterman that then applied to all of us. And Sally became a mentor and a role model for all of us. And what were the policies? Well, they offered time? Sally a six month maternity leave and she told them it was too long. <laughs> um, the executive committee had a baby shower for Sally, for her last baby. These men who had never attended a baby mm -hmm. shower organized this event. She got paged and asked to come into the, made, the biggest conference room in the firm. She went in fear and trepidation to discover that there was a cake and a punch bowl and balloons. That's wonderful. And, a, and a, some presents. And one of the presents was 
a bent wood high chair. And there was a matching child size bent wood rocker. And that high chair got passed on from women lawyer to women lawyer as we all had our children. That's wonderful. It was terrific. So institutionally, it sounds like you had a great support network then to continue your career as your own family um, came into being. But what, what type of personal, did you, did you have any personal struggles with it? I'm sure most women. The problem is there isn't enough time in the day or enough attention to give to these issues. My family always came first. Uh, I never missed a school play. I never missed a, an important pediatrician's appointment. But there were times when I did nothing for me. That was what got sacrificed. Did you find that your clients were very accommodating so long as your firm was? The clients were always terrific. Uh, one of the great joys I've had is that my clients have also become my friends. And the number of jerks who've been clients is a really small number. But I heard very early on in the process, in fact, in my first law firm that I worked for in Minneapolis, that you can tell a lot about uh, clients by the lawyers they choose to hire. Really nasty lawyers, or really nasty clients tend to hire nasty lawyers. And nice lawyers tend to get nice clients. Uh, so I've, had the, I've been blessed with nice clients. And I understand that you actually implemented a couple structural changes to Hogan itself to try and make it more accommodating uh, for a work-life balance. Um, including starting a daycare or emergency daycare system? When we moved into our building not far from where we're sitting today, we set up an, a backup day daycare system. It's not for every day, but for when your regular child care arrangements fall through, it's there. And it's for lawyers and it's for staff. Uh, women who are returning from maternity leave can bring their, ch their infant in for several months while they're still nursing to be sure that they can make that transition as easily as possible. We have a lot of lawyers who work part-time now. I never worked part-time. I never found it necessary. When I took my three-month maternity leave, I came back and told the managing partner that it had been time well spent because I realized I would go absolutely nuts as if I didn't work. So what would you say is the status of women today? Uh, obviously, it's changed quite a bit, I would say, for the better. I think that's true. Uh, I think we have the largest percentage of women partners of any law firm in the country at Hogan & Hartson. We're really proud of that. A very significant number of women partners work part-time. It's possible to make partner while working part-time. All of those things are an effort to, co to accommodate the really significant demands that women will continue to disproportionately face, at least through my lifetime. Uh, men take advantage of our paternity policy, but it's just not the same. <laughs> I'd like to shift topics a little bit and talk about your involvement with the section of antitrust sure. law. In looking at your, your bio, you, you have had many positions within the organization, and I guess if you could start by telling us why you decided to get involved. I went to an annual meeting. It was Frankly, it was a boondoggle. It was in Hawaii. And I'd not been to Hawaii, and I thought, this is a great chance. I'll go to Hawaii, and we get to deduct this. <laughs> so my husband, who's also a lawyer, and I went to Honolulu and decided, as long as we were there for the annual meeting, we'd better go to some of these. So I attended lots of annual meeting programs, and I thought, this is wonderful. It's so interesting. So I then signed up, uh, joined the antitrust section, I was working at the time on the big plaintiff's antitrust case that I mentioned earlier, and one of my co-counsel on that matter was the current chair of the antitrust section. So I consulted with him about where he recommended that I start, and he recommended a particular committee, in that case, Civil Practice and Procedure. So I showed up at a meeting of the Civil Practice and Procedure Committee at the spring meeting, raised my hand, volunteered for a project, wrote a chapter of a book, and the rest pretty much happened from there. What I discovered is that in the antitrust section, it is a true meritocracy. If you go and you volunteer and you deliver, you rise above the group really quickly because most people who go and volunteer don't deliver. And so then you have the opportunity to take on more significant responsibility. Which you did. Which you I did. took one role after the other. One role after the other ultimately becoming chair of the section. I became the chair of the section in 1999-2000. And in fact, the ExxonMobil merger was going on 
during the, the period that I was chair-elect and chair of the antitrust section. I had carefully negotiated with the firm that I was going to spend half of my time practicing law and half of my time chairing the antitrust section. And that seemed like a manageable proportion. Except that the year of the ExxonMobil merger, I billed 2,700 hours. Oh my goodness. <laughs> That's and, I had, <laughs> and I had 1,000 hours of ABA work on top of that. Wow. So it wasn't as much fun as I would have liked to have had. Why did, you, <laughs> why did you decide to stay so involved for so long within the section? What, what because I really enjoyed it. Um, it was an opportunity to learn substantive areas of the law that I didn't get in the day-to-day -day practice. And that's one of the reasons I recommend it to younger lawyers today. And it's even more true today, frankly, than it was when I started. Clients today don't want to pay for research memos. I did have the luxury of doing research memos. Today, that's an almost, it, it's like a dinosaur. So to learn an area of law in which you not previously worked, you almost have to do it on someone else's nickel. In this case, you can do it through the antitrust bar. Considering when you first joined back in the 70s all the way through your tenure as chair and now to today, what kind of changes have you seen within the section? It's grown enormously in the sense of people who are involved. Probably the pure membership of the section is smaller than it was, but the number of people who are heavily involved and active I think has increased. The number of people who attend the spring meeting, for example, is probably nearly 2,000, which is an extraordinary number of antitrust lawyers at one time. It's kind of like the swallows in Capistrano. Mm -hmm. um, so that's one important change. I think another significant change from my perspective is the, is the role of women in the section. We were pretty much uh, a very tiny minority when I got started. The first time I went to a post-annual meeting, uh, I've reminisced several times with several of the other women who were there, Mary Cranston, um, Kimball Wood. It was like being a girl at a junior high school dance. <laughs> Everybody knew one another except us. Mm -hmm. We were the new kids. And it was very much an old boys network. Turning back a little bit to antitrust law, um, one thing that has, at least for my few years in practice, really changed is the, um, the, the omnipresence of international competition agencies. How have you seen that change happen over the past, your past career? Well, I think it's turned out that antitrust has been America's, one of America's most successful exports. Uh, we went from having a handful of places in the, country, in the world that mattered from antitrust perspective to having lots of places that we have to worry about. Uh, still the most significant remain the major OECD trading partners, the United States, the European Commission, the Canadians, Western Europe, Japan. But the growth, the notion that there could be antitrust in a communist country, for example, is pretty extraordinary, but there will be an antitrust law in China. Um, how you square what is still to a large degree a government-driven economy with a free market system is going to be very interesting to see. Well then, coming towards the end of our conversation today, looking back on your career, what do you think are the most important lessons that you have learned? In order to give good antitrust advice, and perhaps this is true of almost any kind of a lawyer, you need to understand what it is your client wants to accomplish and why in order to be able to explain it to anyone else. That's the first question I ask every client. What is it you're doing and why? And let the client's business objectives try to drive your analysis. But be as practical as possible and tell the clients where the risks are. Don't overstep your bounds. You're not the business person. You're there to tell them what can and can't be accomplished, and in an extreme case, what might or might not be illegal. But the client makes the business decision, and so you need to know where the line is. You've mentioned a number of female mentors that helped you. Are there any other men who were tremendous influences on you? Well, within my own firm, there were no other women in the antitrust group when I started. Uh, I had two principal mentors. Uh, Lee Lovinger, who'd been the head of the antitrust division at the beginning of the Kennedy administration, and Marty Michelson, who left before I became a partner to become counsel at Harvard University. So I had plenty of male mentors. I also had male mentors in the antitrust bar because there had only been 
one woman chairman ahead of me, Carla Hills, and Carla was no longer active in the section by the time I then had entered the leadership. So a number of the male chairs of the section were my mentors. And Tom Leary, who was, later became a Federal Trade Commission, was a member of the Council of the Antitrust Section when he joined us, and he became one of my mentors. And I'm tr I continue to treasure my mentor relationship with Tom Leary. Well, finally, what words of wisdom would you have for young attorneys as they begin their careers in antitrust? In antitrust, uh, enjoy it because it provides the opportunity to learn about your client's business from the ground up, in depth, on a crash basis. I describe my practice as having ranged from tuna fish to tanks because I have canned tuna fish, I've worked on three tuna mergers, and I have ridden in the M1, A2, Abrams tank. Uh, <laughs> the opportunity to learn about areas of of the economy that you have know absolutely nothing about is just wonderful. Well, thank you for joining us today. Delighted, thank we you. We appreciate your time.